Well, my parting shot leaving the office today was five monarchs on the Joe Pye week, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very exciting. I know. I was up at a, at a Windy Hill and Peterson's property, and uh, there were just, they were everywhere up there. Is there Joe Pye weed up there? No, not that there was a little, but not um, yeah. not in in large amounts. Um, well, not, I, I imagine. Yeah, I'm going to. I think it's tricky because we don't always have waiting room is is new. We don't always employ the waiting room, but I'm trying to adhere to um, Zoom's <laughs> security uh, features. So. When I start talking, if I look really distracted, it's probably because I have messages popping up on my screen that I have people in the waiting room. Um, so I will quickly hand things over to Haley. Um, but before I do, I wanted to just thank all of you for joining us for this virtual presentation on monarch conservation. Um, I think we timed it quite well this year. They are certainly out in force and, and flying around all over the Mount Washington Valley. I did want to thank our Nature Program Series sponsors um, for their financial support of our programming, Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment. So we do appreciate their support. Um, and just a plug for some of our fall programs. We've got great programs in the works. Um, if you get our trivia emails, you've seen some of those coming up um, in a week and a half. We have, um, we have Will Broussard is going to be leading a bird walk down on the Ossipi Pine Barrens on their ADA trail. So a nice, gentle, Raid leading out to an overlook and be doing some birding there. Um, that's on September 12th, one of our field programs. Um, you know that is limited to um, that is limited to just 13 participants. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can give the center a call and we can sign you up for that. Um, some of our our upcoming programs. Um, but I am, oh, and I also have a note here just. Um, mm -hmm. What, I think we, ha we have some staff watching tonight, um, you know, in particular, because one of the things this fall um, in our sort of new novel ways of interacting with, um, with the schools that we work with while maintaining distance and ideally, um, you know, doing 100% of the participation outside, um, one of there is a project to set up long-term monitoring plots um, to monitor monarch abundance um, with students collecting data that's happening, um, you know, that's starting up this fall at Freiburg Academy. So that's a, that's a fun new sort of long-term um, partnership that we are working on. So plug for some of, some of the, the school stuff that not all of our, not everyone hears about, but you know, it's something that's very exciting. Um, and, but someone who does know about outreach and, um, and working with groups is, you know, is our presenter this evening. We're very lucky to have Ailey, sorry, Haley Andriozzi here from uh, UNH Cooperative Extension. She is the Wildlife Outreach Program Manager um, and is going to talk to us about monarch conservation. Um, before I hand things over to Haley completely, if, um, if you've not joined us for one of our Zoom presentations, um, I would ask two things of you. One, um, if you can go ahead and mute yourself. Um, that way we don't pick up any side conversations um, that are going on in your household. You probably don't want it projected to the rest of the group. Um, if you do have a question, um, a great way to save it is to, to type it right into the chat feature. Um, I'll be monitoring that and if there is an immediate clarifying question. Um, I'll jump in and um, you know and get Haley to answer it. Otherwise, um, we'll save them to the end, and I will read those out to Haley. You'll also have the opportunity um, at the end of the program to unmute yourself and ask those questions of her directly. Um, but otherwise, with that, um, Haley, thank you, and I'm going to hand the show over to you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nora, and everyone else, thanks for being here. Um, 
I'm happy to talk about monarchs this time of year. You know, as Nora mentioned, it's a, a really great few week period to be talking about monarchs. They seem to kind of, well, they I'll tell you why in a minute, but they kind of have this generational burst right now that allows us to see a lot of the adults. And um, so it's a really exciting time to think about all these individuals that are gonna start out on a really incredible journey um, very shortly. So um, I'll formally introduce myself and just tell you a little bit about what I do at UNH Cooperative Extension. Again, Haley Andriozzi, I'm the Wildlife Outreach Manager. Um, a lot of my work has to do with um, stewardship and conservation of wildlife habitats in the state of New Hampshire. And then increasingly, a larger portion of my work has to do with citizen science around wildlife. Um, so we'll get to kind of the citizen science piece towards the end of the presentation, but monarchs are a good kind of representation of those two different bins of, of my work of what I do. Um, because, you know, for the last five or six years, I've been working pretty closely with New Hampshire Fish and Game Department to think about how to increase the amount of habitat for pollinators and um, monarchs included in that category. Um, in New Hampshire, working with volunteers, natural resources professionals, other agencies, um, landowners, and increasingly, we're also trying to get folks involved in citizen science efforts for monarchs. So we'll touch on both of those things as well as the ecology of the species a little bit here. And let's see if my clicker will work. Okay, so most of you, um, I hope, are familiar with monarchs. It's likely that you are. Um, they're pretty showy, beautiful butterflies. And uh, even if you've just seen any sort of illustration or drawing of a butterfly, it's likely that that's uh, kind of a generalization or a caricature of a monarch. They kind of are like the face of butterflies and, you know, the face of pollinators in a lot of ways. Um, but just to formally introduce you, this is a monarch butterfly. Um, so again, they're relatively showy. They're relatively large as well. They're around three and a half to four inches across um, when their wings are open, if you measure their wingspan. And they're this orange color, dark orange, sometimes lighter orange, especially on the underwing and depending um, on the coloration of that specific individual. They have this dark black venation. This really distinctive two rows of white, although sometimes orange spots along the wing margin um, in that black border. And, you know, I point out what they look like because there are some lookalikes um, for monarchs. So there are some other butterflies that you might see here in New Hampshire that you might mistake for monarchs. Um, one of those is the painted lady butterfly. Painted ladies have that same orange, black and white coloration, although the pattern on their wings is very different and their underwings are very, very different. So when these butterflies are uh, have their wings folded up and you're just seeing the underside, they're much more neutral in color, but it is possible if you just see an orange, black and white butterfly fluttering across the landscape that it's a painted lady. So that's a possibility. But the much more um, common or frequently confused butterfly for monarchs is the viceroy butterfly. Um, so viceroys have, again, that same orange coloration. They have that dark black venation throughout the wings. They too also have white spots in a double row along the wing margin. However, the main distinguishing characteristic between the viceroy and the monarchs is this black perpendicular line that's pointed out down in the bottom picture with that yellow arrow. That black perpendicular vein that runs um, perpendicular to all the other veins on the, on the hind wing of the butterfly. And so monarchs, if I show you a picture of them, do not have that. Um, monarch veination is much more lobed in nature. They don't have that black vein that runs perpendicular to the others. So that's really the only thing you need to know to be able to tell the difference between a viceroy and a monarch. But both are pretty common. You'll see both very frequently in New Hampshire. Um, so that's helpful to know the difference between the two. And just because it's interesting, I'll point out that it is possible to tell male and female monarchs apart. Um, males have these two distinct black spots on the top surface of their hind wings, whereas females, as you can see, do not. Um, in other butterflies, spots similar to these in similar locations emit pheromones. So they um, are, males are using uh, these little pouches of pheromones to attract a female mate. However, that's not the case with monarchs. They don't actually contain or emit pheromones. And so scientists and researchers aren't really sure why monarch males have these spots, but Regardless, they do, and so it allows us to identify the gender um, visually in instances when we need to do that. So that's the monarch, and again, you've probably met them before, either seen them or heard of them. But what you probably also know about the monarch or have heard about the monarch is that they have a really incredible migration. So they have this miraculous migration that um, 
I'm going to do my best to explain to you uh, in terms, you know, migration is relatively circular because it's happening on a seasonal pattern. So we'll start with what's happening now. Um, so each fall, uh, monarchs travel from their summer breeding grounds to overwintering locations. And so it's important to point out that there's two um, relatively distinct populations of monarchs here in the U.S. Um, we have monarchs that occur east of the Rocky Mountains, the eastern monarch population, and that population is spending their summer breeding in the Corn Belt, in New England, up into southern Canada. And in the fall, those monarchs in the eastern population are migrating 3,000 miles down to wintering grounds in central Mexico. There's a western population of monarchs as well that occur west of the Rocky Mountains, and those butterflies are making a much shorter migration each fall just to the California coast. And there is some evidence of interchange between these two populations. So there are situations where an individual might fly from the western population to the eastern population by flying over the Rockies and vice versa. Um, there are situations where a butterfly that has um, been born in the western population for some reason flies down to the overwintering habitat in Mexico as opposed to the, that in California. And there are also some situations where a butterfly that maybe was born in the eastern population overwinters in Mexico, then for some reason flies to uh, the area west of the Rocky Mountains to breed. So that exchange is relatively minimal. Again, they are pretty distinct populations, although they're not genetically distinct. Um, but they function as kind of two separate units. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the eastern population. It's much larger. It's the population that we are surrounded by here in New England. And it's the one that you hear the most about in terms of the current status and situation that monarchs are dealing with. And so this migration in the fall from their summer breeding grounds to overwintering habitat is uh, driven by a few different things. Um, the day starts to decrease. So we see decreasing day length, um, decreasing temperatures, and also um, the availability of host plants in the form of milkweed and um, food resources in the form of a variety of nectar plants start to decrease as well. And so that triggers uh, these monarchs to go into the start of a uh, migratory generation. And so unlike the summer generations of monarchs, monarchs that were born in the summer um, in our, the breeding area that live for just two to six weeks, um, butterflies that are born as part of the migratory generation of monarchs can live up to nine months. And so starting um, in mid-August up until now into September, um, but Butterflies that are born enter what's called reproductive diapause. And so they basically do not reproduce. So instead of reproducing, those butterflies that are born in this migratory generation, August and September, are going to um, put all of their energy and resources into that 3,000 mile migration to central Mexico, a place that miraculously they have never been before. So the individuals that are migrating in the fall from here down to Mexico have never been there before. So it's incredible, I think. <laughs> um, when they reach their destination in central Mexico, typically around early November, they are aggregating in these Oyamel fir trees. And so some of you have probably heard of these high elevation fir forests where monarchs are congregating in such high densities that the trees are just blanketed in butterflies. And so you can see an example of that here. And so these trees are found again in high elevations on south and southwest facing mountain slopes. Um, just west of Mexico City in central Mexico. And these, these high elevation forests provide cool temperatures, they provide water availability um, and shelter for the butterflies to protect them from predators. And so those are the conditions that this butterfly needs to be able to just hang out for the winter, um, save up all its energy reserves um, before it then in the spring needs to head back up north a little bit. Um, so again, these migratory butterflies are coming down to Mexico, living nine months um, and hanging out in these trees for the duration of winter. And you can see from this map that there's just about 12 butterfly colonies that occur. So all of the butterflies that we see here in New England and elsewhere throughout um, the eastern U.S., east of the Rocky Mountains, all of the monarch butterflies that occur there um, as the in the migratory generation are spending their winter down in these just 12 colonies. So that's pretty incredible as well. So they spend their winter in Mexico, and then in March, um, this same generation begins the journey north into Texas and the southern states of the United States, laying eggs and nectaring on flowering plants as they migrate and breed. Um, the first generation of offspring from the overwintering population um, 
start to continue the journey from the south, the southern U.S. Um, up to the northeast eventually to colonize the eastern breeding grounds uh, late April through May. And then typically those that we're seeing here in New England are the second and third generation, those monarchs that we're seeing in June and July. Um, and so basically monarchs are using this breeding strategy to migrate up to more northern latitudes. So the first generation is occupying the southern U.S., the second generation is moving a little bit farther north, the third generation is getting them a little bit farther north, until that fourth generation, which is the generation being born um, again now, and is typically the one that migrates through central um, and southern U.S. into central Mexico and spends their winter there. It's not really understood how monarchs migrate. Um, how exactly they know how to do what they do. Um, it's thought that it has something to do with the use of the sun as a compass and also something to do with the Earth's mag magnetic field. But again, it's not, not completely understood. So for everything we know about monarchs, which is a lot when you compare to what we know about other butterflies and other insects and pollinators in a lot of cases, uh, we still don't know everything. But we do know that monarchs, like other butterflies and moths, undergo what's called complete metamorphosis. So this means that they have an egg, they have larva in the form of a caterpillar, they have a pupil stage in the form of a chrysalis, and they have an adult stage, which is the butterfly that we're all familiar with seeing. Um, and I think you guys can see my pointer here, but um, if you can't, uh, what you're seeing over on the very left-hand side of this leaf um, is one tiny, uh, pin pin size or pencil point sized egg. And so monarch butterflies, female monarchs, uh, will lay their eggs on milkweed plants. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but they lay their eggs exclusively on milkweed plants. And females lay one single egg at a time. So just one of those tiny white dots. Um, however, they can lay anywhere from 300 to 500 eggs over the course of their reproductive life. So in the two to six weeks that they're alive, they're breeding you know, for potentially up to five weeks or laying eggs for up to five weeks of that time and laying hundreds of eggs. So their, their evolutionary strategy is really to um, produce offspring, produce offspring, produce offspring as quickly as they can in their relatively short life. And that milkweed where that egg was laid um, provides food and shelter for caterpillars, monarch caterpillars for approximately two weeks. And that timing is gonna vary a little bit depending on temperature, but somewhere around two weeks is the length of time that monarchs are spending in that caterpillar stage. And that caterpillar is just eating constantly. It's just taking in mon uh, milkweed material, um, eating and working to grow bigger and bigger. Um, it really pauses only to shed its skin. And so the period before or between each shedding of its skin or basically its molt is called an instar. So that might be a term that you've heard before for monarchs is that they have uh, five instars or five molting stages basically. So again, I think you can see my pointer, but if you see the tiniest caterpillar, um, that's the first instar, second instar is the next biggest, third, fourth, and then the fifth instar is that a uh, very large, meaty looking grub-like uh, monarch caterpillar. And so that's the fifth instar. It's that fifth instar that will ultimately crawl away from the milkweed plant um, where it was feeding on, and it will find a secure spot relatively nearby um, to form a silk pad, hang itself upside down into a little bit of a J-shape, and it will shed its skin one last time to reveal this beautiful, shiny, bright green chrysalis. And so, you know, historically, you imagine that the secure spot that this caterpillar was looking for was typically, like you see here, pictured the underside of a branch, the underside of a twig, somewhere that's providing shelter for this um, now immobile stage, life stage of the monarch to um, go through this last final transformation before emerging as an adult, um, you know, protected from predators, protected from the elements. However, now there's also, you know, human-made shelter. Um, and so often people will see these chrysalises on the, I've seen them hanging off the clapboards of folks' houses, um, like the edge of a cedar clapboard, um, the handle of a five gallon bucket. So really you can see them anywhere. So um, throughout the summer season, you know, you can be keeping your eye out for these little um, bright, shiny green chrysalises and they're, they're pretty remarkable. And somewhere in the range of one to two weeks, um, an adult emerges from that chrysalis. So as you get closer to that two week mark, you can start to see the adult monarch inside the chrysalis. Um, once it actually emerges, you know, if you've ever seen a monarch that just emerged, it looks like it's almost soaking wet. And that's because it's actually working to pump fluid to its wings to give them shape. 
Um, and then it spends several hours just hanging there drying before it flies off. They mate a few days later. So anytime within the first week of life, they'll start mating. And again, adults typically live anywhere from two to six weeks. So it's a, a cycle that continues until that migratory generation when, um, again, they are living much longer and uh, spending their energy reserves to fly down south to overwintering grounds. So I mentioned milkweed um, and, you know, as being the plant where female monarchs lay their eggs. And from a habitat perspective, milkweed plays a really crucial role in the life cycle of monarch butterflies. Uh, monarch caterpillars need milkweed to grow and develop. They cannot eat anything else other than milkweed. Um, and adult monarchs, because of that, need milkweed to be able to lay their eggs. So they are looking exclusively for milkweed to be able to lay their eggs, knowing that their caterpillars need that food source in order to grow and survive to their reproductive stage. So this is typically where we see milkweed, um, you know, these open, relatively sunny areas, old fields, areas that have been cleared. And you can see, again, I think my pointer, but just scattered milkweed growing in, um, growing in this field a little bit. Um, here's a monarch caterpillar crawling on a milkweed pod, which is some of you are likely familiar with. It's the seed pod of the milkweed plant, which um, you're seeing this time of year as well. And so without milkweed, monarchs will not exist on the landscape. It's considered its host plant. So um, it's required for monarchs to uh, be present. But I do want to point out that it's not just about milkweed. Um, so adult monarchs will and need to drink the nectar of many, many different flowering plants in addition to milkweed. So they need flowering plants to nourish them throughout the growing season and um, throughout these multiple generations. So from uh, end of spring, early summer until the fall, um, they need nectar resources from a variety of flowering plants to fuel their breeding as well as to then fuel their migration. And so while milkweed is really, really important for the breeding factor of monarch ecology, um, in terms of growth, development, and um, survival, those adults really require a variety of food sources. So milkweed gets a lot of attention, and rightfully so, but a variety of flowering plants is required for monarchs to be on the landscape as well. So uh, why are we talking about monarchs? <laughs> I think there's a couple reasons we could list already, right? They're beautiful. I hope I've made that case. Uh, they have a miraculous migration. I think their breeding is also you know, incredibly impressive. Um, but the real reason that we are talking about monarchs is that there's been around a 90% um, decline in monarch populations over the last 20 years. And so researchers estimate that's a loss of around 900 million monarch butterflies um, over the last two decades. And currently the species is being petitioned for listing as a with threatened status under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And so that decision will be made in December of this year. So in December of 2020, there's potential that the monarch could be listed as a threatened species at the federal level. Um, and this is a graph, I promise it's the only one I will show you, but <laughs> this is a graph that shows um, basically the relative abundance of monarchs from year to year over the last 25 years or so. And you know they cannot individually count individual monarch butterflies. We can't do that here in the breeding grounds because they're so scattered across the landscape and you're only observing uh, one incidental monarch at a time potentially. And at the overwintering grounds, they are, occur in such high densities at those dozen or so um, overwintering areas that you could not possibly count them. Um, there's literally, you saw in those pictures, monarchs on top of monarchs. Instead, um, the area of forest that is densely coated with butterflies is used as basically a, uh, a proxy to um, measure the monarch abundance in any given year. So they know, all right, there's about 5,000 butterflies per square meter. When they look up into the forest canopy, they see how much of the forest canopy, how much forest area is covered with monarch butterflies, and they're using that as a, a way to get at relative monarch abundance. So you can see here over the last 25 years, while there is year-to-year -year variability, if you were to draw a line on this graph, you'd see a pretty significant decline. And um, I'll point out to you, I've got to move this out of the way on my screen, just two years ago, um, in 2018 to 2019, you know, there were around six hectares of forests that contained monarch butterflies. And so that was an exciting year. You know, after several years of decline, almost a decade of relative decline um, in monarch butterflies, that was a pretty good year. And six acres, six hectares rather, is somewhat a magic number. 
um, where researchers believe that if they can maintain an area, a forested area that contains monarch butterflies of six hectares in size, you know, from year to year, that there would be a relatively stable monarch population that was capable of continuing and uh, being viable into the future. However, last winter, we had a pretty significant decline from that area, so less than three hectares. Uh, so that's the difference between around 300 million butterflies or so and less than 150 million butterflies or so, so less than half the population um, in a given year. So um, again, there's going to be year-to-year -year variability, but if we look at the trend over the last 20, 25 years, um, it paints a pretty dismal picture for the current status of the monarch butterfly. And some people, although maybe none of you because you showed up tonight to hear about it, but some people might say, uh, why care about monarchs? Um, and the reality is that insects in general are really effective indicators of environmental health. Um, they have short life cycles, they use small habitat patches, and so they respond really quickly to ecosystem changes, and they have a really high sensitivity for detecting changes. Um, they also use a wide range of terrestrial habitats, so it's not just one habitat we're talking about. They're indicators of environmental health in terrestrial habitats across the world um, of all types and sizes and shapes. Um, and their insect diversity also accounts for a large proportion of all biodiversity on the planet. So when we're thinking about, um, you know, insects as indicators of environmental health, it's a large proportion of our biodiversity. And the reality is that many, many, many other insects and many other pollinators face threats and declines that are really similar to those that we're seeing in the monarch butterfly, but we might just not know as much about those insects. They're not as well studied. Um, they're not as charismatic, quite frankly. So again, monarchs are especially beautiful and kind of serve as like the poster child for insects and butterflies in a lot of cases. And in some cases, there are species that we don't even know exist yet, most likely. So um, anything that we do to benefit monarchs is going to benefit a wide variety of those other insects and pollinators that are seeing similar declines. So what exactly is threatening the monarch? And um, I put this here as a really simple question, but the reality is that the answer is not that simple. Um, so there are a variety of factors that are driving the decline of the monarch butterfly. It's not just one thing. And so that makes addressing the population declines a little bit more complicated than if there was just one thing we could put our finger on or snap our fingers and say, all right, it's fixed. Um, we can't necessarily do that. There's a lot of uh, dynamics here and um, factors at play that are causing the decline in this species. Remember, it travels thousands of miles through multiple states, three countries, um, multiple generations each year, year-to-year -year variability. So there's a lot that needs to go right in order for monarch breeding and monarch migration to be successful. So uh, this is maybe a lot to look at, but some of the things that are affecting the monarch butterfly population include um, loss of breeding habitat, so a reduction in milkweed. So the reality is we just have less milkweed on the landscape than we did previously, um, particularly in agricultural landscapes, but also other landscapes, you know, here in New England, for example, where some of those habitats that previously hosted milkweed plants are some of the easiest to develop, and so we don't see as much milkweed on the landscape. There's also habitat loss at those overwintering sites in central Mexico. And that's due to a variety of reasons, legal and illegal logging, um, conversion of areas to farmland. Um, and also, we're already seeing some effects of climate change on the dynamics of those oil fur stands, specifically water availability. And so those are having some impacts on monarchs there as well. Um, climate change in general can, um, you know, those inclement and extreme weather patterns can have a impact on a species like monarchs. Um, and again, they depend on a diversity of resources across a pretty large landscape. And so their timing of migration is also driven by env environmental cues. And so as a migratory species, they're particularly vulnerable to climate change. Uh, pesticides and herbicides, we've seen, you know, an increase in the use of some of those chemicals over the last several decades and, um, you know, the use of those just inherently by what they're meant to do, which is to kill plants and kill insects, um, have potential negative ramifications for the monarch population. There's some natural enemies for monarchs, um, mostly a species of tachnid fly that um, eats the larva, but also wasps. There are some birds, especially in the over overwintering habitats that have the ability to um, feed on monarchs. 
And then there's pathogens and diseases. So viruses, bacteria, and fungi, all that affect um, monarch butterflies. The most prevalent is a protozoan parasite called Ophriocystis um, electroshira, uh, most commonly just referred to as OE. And so that OE um, parasite is uh, relatively nasty and has the potential to impact individual monarchs, but have a population effect as well. So here's just a visualization of what some of those negative impacts look like. Um, you know, on the top left is milkweed growing in an agricultural setting, likely to be managed. Um, in the bottom left is uh, the situation in central Mexico. So again, they're facing similar land use patterns and changes to what we see here, which is that the habitat that does exist is being fragmented into smaller and smaller patches, again, due to farmland conversion, logging. Um, so they're seeing some of that, that fragmentation and habitat loss on the ground there. Um, in the bottom right is a news article from a few years ago that was reporting on you know, some really severe weather shifts at the overwintering sites in Mexico where they actually saw snow and cold and had some mass die-offs of monarchs due to those conditions. And in the top right is a butterfly that's impacted with the OE, that, that parasite, um, which can influence um, the wing development of individual monarchs, basically you know, leaving them relatively useless in terms of flight and breeding. And so effectively, they're just lost from the, the population. And again, unfortunately, it's not just monarchs where people are seeing declines. Um, so this is an article from the New York Times Magazine and a, a couple of years ago, I think in 2018, that uh, cited what they called the insect apocalypse. And the author was describing, you know, experience from when he was younger, I think in Copenhagen or somewhere in Europe, um, driving in a car and having so many bugs hit the windshield that you had to turn your windshield wipers on at night or you know, riding your bike and having the experience of bugs just flying in your mouth or hitting you in the face. And I think for a lot of us, we maybe remember some of those experiences you know, even just 20 years ago or so. But if you think back to the last time that happened, it might be a little bit longer than you realize. Um, so we don't really see insects in, that number, in those numbers in a lot of places anymore. Um, so it's kind of a shared worldwide experience, this decline in insect populations over the last several decades. And the reality is we just don't have a handle on what exactly is happening um, and what the potential ramifications are for the rest of life on Earth. So it's a question that folks are starting to ask and, and trying to understand. Um, and monarchs are maybe one of those species where we, again, have more information than, than others. Um, so that paints kind of a dismal picture of the current status of monarchs, but the good news is that there are many individuals, organizations, agencies, and other sectors playing a role in conserving the monarch. And so this phrase, all hands on deck, was used in a paper that was published a couple years ago that strategized how um, monarch habitat could be restored in the Midwestern United States. Um, but the phrase and take home messages are true for us here in New England as well. Um, so here you can see a map of US Fish and Wildlife Service's conservation uh, priority areas for the monarch butterfly. And while the highest priority areas for conservation are definitely in the Midwest, um, you know, throughout the Corn Belt, that's where they have monarchs in the highest numbers, that's where they have monarchs in the highest densities, that's where, you know, any sort of habitat conservation or habitat creation is going to have the highest impact. You'll see that here in New England, we're not nothing on the conservation priorities list. We're just basically the next step down. And ultimately, monarchs are a species, again, with a very large range. They're traveling a large area. They require nectar resources throughout their migratory range. And so anything that we do here in New England is really going to have a positive impact on the population as a whole. Um, so none of this is isolated. So we can't just rely on one Midwestern state to do something. Uh, these Butterflies don't know state borders, so we really need to um, implement some of these actions as well. So there is a mid-American monarch conservation strategy. We have a northeast strategy as well that's based on a lot of those same similar strategies that are in that mid-America strategy. And no matter which strategy you look at or who you talk to, um, it's clear that it's going to take collaboration from individuals and groups in many sectors to conserve monarchs. Um, most of what we can do here in the U.S. to have a big impact for monarchs is to improve monarch habitat. 
And when we say improve monarch habitat here in the US, what we primarily mean is increasing the amount of milkweed. Um, although again, those other nectar resources are important as well. So that all hands on deck study indicated that we would need in the United States more than 1.3 billion, with a B, new stems of milkweed to reach the monarch population goal that researchers have set, set out. Um, creating that amount of milkweed habitat is going to involve, it's not going to happen without involving agricultural producers, um, utility rights of way, urban areas, and public lands. And again, the good news is that a lot of that work is already happening, and here in New England, a lot of those sectors are already involved as well. And there are also many ways that you as individuals, homeowners, landowners, and volunteers can play a role in helping monarchs. Again, promoting milkweed is one of the primary things we can do to benefit monarchs, because without milkweed on the landscape, monarchs won't exist on the landscape. So it's a really good first step, and it's a really impactful first step. Uh, again, monarch caterpillars need milkweed to grow and develop, and those adult female monarchs are looking for milkweed in order to be able to lay their eggs. And milkweed is also beneficial to other pollinators, so it's not just about monarchs. Milkweed flowers will also be used as nectar resources by a variety of bees and other butterflies and other pollinators. And the good news is that monarch is re uh, milkweed rather is relatively easy to establish, so in many places you'll just see milkweed come in if you let the land do what it does. Um, if you simply leave an open area unmowed um, and see what comes in naturally, here in New England, in a lot of cases, you'll have milkweed come in within the first year or two. So when people are looking to establish milkweed habitat, that's often our first recommendation is to say, you know, just leave a patch of your yard or an area of your property unmowed and see what happens. But if milkweed doesn't come in naturally, um, it is relatively easy to plant. So you should always use locally sourced seeds when possible. And the good news is that there's many resources available for selecting species of milkweed that can and should be planted in certain areas. So here you'll see five of the species that we have found here in the Northeast region, five of the most common species. Common milkweed, which is the species pictured here in this picture, um, is probably the species that we see most frequently. Um, but swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, world milkweed, poke milkweed, all of these milkweeds in the Asclepius genus uh, will, can and will be used by monarch butterflies. So butterfly weed is one, for instance, that I know a lot of people plant in their gardens because it has a really beautiful color. And so that's one that um, you know, some of our landscapers really prefer, but is still benefiting monarch butterflies. Um, there's also a lot of good resources for identifying sources for seed. And so if you go to this plantmilkweed.org, it's kind of a clearinghouse of seed sources and also has instructions for how to think about um, harvesting and propagating your own milkweed seeds. Say for instance, you have some milkweed plants or your neighbor does or your friend does nearby and you want them on your property in a certain area, you can get instructions there for doing that as well. And now's the time of year to start thinking about doing that. One unique threat to milkweed habitat is um, black swallowwort. And so that's a, the species pictured here. It's an invasive plant. Um, so it's an invasive vine that kind of ten, tends to take over areas. It's not native to New England. Um, it, it tends to take over and create monocultures of black swallowwort. And black swallowwort acts as a sink for the monarch population. So black swallowwort is in the milkweed family, but it's not in that Asclepius genus that all the other milkweeds that are utilized by monarchs are in. So adult female monarch butterflies will lay their eggs on black swallowwort, confusing or mistaking it for milkweed. However, the caterpillars won't eat it. So once uh, that egg transitions to that first instar, Based, effectively the caterpillar starves to death and so it acts as a sink for the population where these adult monarch butterflies are putting all of their resources into um, laying eggs on the black swallowwort and it's never effectively having any return for the population. And so one way you can help benefit monarchs and help you know promote good habitat is to uh, remove and eradicate black swallowwort if and when you see it. But again, it's not just about milkweed. So adult monarchs drink the nectar of many flowers in addition to milkweed. They need it, things that are blooming throughout that growing season. So a variety of, of bloom times, diversity of bloom times. And the good news is that if you can provide flowers that are blooming from you know, spring until fall, providing these different nectar resources, both during the breeding period and for the fall migration, you're also providing yourself with some really beautiful blooms for you and your uh, other people who see them to enjoy all season long. 
Monarch nectar plants and flowering plants in general tend to do best in open sunny sites. And there's a lot of resources available to help with plant selection and site establishment. So this is um, a resource from the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They do a lot of work and research on invertebrates and pollinators in general, but they developed this monarch nectar plant list specific to the Northeast. So it's plants that are native to our region, plants that monarchs are known to feed on, and plants that are going to provide um, that variety of bloom times. So provide blooms from uh, so early summer into fall. So that's a very good resource. Um, similarly, one of my colleagues who's now retired, Kathy Neal at UNH Cooperative Extension, spent about a decade researching wildflower meadow establishment in New England. So specifically, how can we establish wildflower meadows here on our soils, with our site conditions, with our weather patterns? Uh, what are best practices for preparing a site? What are the best plants that are going to take and hold and require the least amount of maintenance over time? And so that's not specific to monarchs, but it's specific to pollinators. And so monarchs are going to benefit from any efforts um, using these resources as well. So similarly, she has a, a plant list, a flowering calendar that provides uh, and suggestions for flowers that are, are gonna bloom throughout the season because that's not just best practice for monarchs, it's best practice for pollinator habitat in general. And although monarchs and other pollinators might use a variety of nectar plant species, and that includes exotic plants, you know, plants that are not native to here. It includes invasive plants. They will feed on invasive plants as well. It's really recommended to plant native plant species. And that's because native plants are, in general, more beneficial to ecosystems. Um, they're adapted to local soils and climates, and they help to promote biological diversity. And so here's a picture of some native wildflower seed mix that we planted several years ago. Um, and ultimately, native plants can be easier to maintain in the landscape once they're established. So they don't get away from you, uh, or you don't have to fight as hard to keep them around, depending on whether you're working with an invasive or an exotic. In areas where you are maintaining milkweed or pollinator habitat, you can work to conduct mowing in a way that minimizes monarch mortality and promotes high native plant diversity. Um, so mowing is a very effective management tool to controlling woody species, so keeping out any sort of woody stems or controlling weedy species. So if you think about why you mow your lawn, it's because you don't want woody or weedy things coming in. However, mowing too often in areas that you hope to have as milkweed or pollinator habitat um, or during certain time frames can result in higher mortality for wildlife species, and that includes monarchs, and also a decrease in the available habitat on the landscape. Um, so to limit mortality to monarchs and other pollinators, you can avoid mowing the entire habitat at once. So you can basically do what's being done in this picture in a way, which is mow a certain area, but leave what would be considered a refuge area for wildlife that are using the site at the time of mowing. So leaving some habitat on the ground so that they can utilize that habitat, even if you're effectively removing the habitat by mowing. Um, in other places. And so this also allows for recolonization of that mode site. So when that mode area does come back into a plant structure that's uh, usable by monarchs and other pollinators, they're right there, ready and able to take advantage of it once it's in the a proper state. Um, if possible, you want to avoid mowing native plants when they're in bloom. So when they are providing a valuable nectar resource for pollinators, um, you want to let them do that and wait until they've, they've gone out of bloom to mow. And you also want to wait potentially until they've dispersed seed. So that's what's going to allow your flowering nectar resources to come back year after year is if you allow them to go to seed naturally and don't mow them first. Um, you also want to limit mowing to no more than twice per year, but even less than that if possible. So if you can get away with mowing some of these pollinator habitats and wildflower, me uh, wildflower meadows and milkweed habitat areas uh, less, just twice a year, maybe once a year, even every other year, um, mowing too frequently disrupts plant growth and also affects the ability of flowering plants to outcompete grasses. So again, you think about why you mow your lawn, you will mow it really frequently. You don't see flowers in it very often. Um, the less you mow, the more flowers you're going to see come in. And that's up to a certain point, right? Because if you let it go too long, then more of your woody species are gonna come in. And eventually, like here in New England, everything wants to turn to forest. But if you can get away with mowing once a year, potentially every other year, and no more than twice per year, that's recommended for monarchs specifically. You also wanna avoid mowing at night when insects are inactive and unable to escape the mower. And the general time of mowing is also critical. 
Um, so untimely mowing can result in high insect mortality. So, you know, the insects, eggs, larvae, and even adults of monarch butterflies and other pollinators can be killed directly by the mower. And again, mowing also destroys those landscape features, that plant structure, that structural diversity that these species are requiring um, during certain times of the year. So to minimize impacts, you really want to avoid mowing during times of peak insect activity. And that's gonna vary by species, but here you see recommendations listed that are specific to monarchs. So if you are interested in managing mostly for monarchs, then you would want to think about mowing before May 1st and after October 1st. Um, but in between there, potentially not mowing an area. You also want to avoid the use of herbicides and insecticides, which can both be helpful, uh, harmful to monarchs. So herbicides can reduce uh, floral resources, so those nectar resources, and also the availability of host plants in the forms of milkweed. And insecticides, again, though it's dependent on the timing, rate, and method of application, um, can inherently, just by the fact that they are designed to kill insects, um, have a negative impact on monarchs. And that's not to say you don't you wouldn't be able to use <clears throat> chemicals elsewhere on your property, but um, if you do, just following label instructions and um, just being careful not to use chemicals in places where you are trying to promote that insect uh, pollinator habitat. You also, um, before purchasing plants from nurseries and garden centers, want to be sure to ask whether they've been treated with insecticides. So this includes neonicotinoids, which are a systemic insecticide that's received significant attention for their potential role in pollinator declines worldwide over the last several years. And so the jury's somewhat honestly still out on some of that, but, um, you know, there is clearly some impact from these systemic insecticides, which are uh, in the seeds of the plants and water soluble and inherently end up in all of the plant material. Um, so if something you purchased at one of a garden center um, or a store is treated with those neonicotinoids or other systemic insecticide before you plant it at your home, you're effectively bringing home a plant that could be fatal to monarchs and other pollinators. Okay, so I promised I would get to citizen science and this is where. Uh, so citizen science is another way that you can have a positive impact on monarch conservation. Uh, citizen science, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is the collection of scientific data by individuals who are not professional scientists. So it's often sometimes called public participation in scientific research or community science. Um, but whatever you call it, it ultimately is, you know, folks who are not scientists, who are not researchers, contributing valuable data to a project, to a conservation effort. And there's a long history of citizen science programs around monarch monitoring, and that dates all the way back to the 1950s when volunteers helped to identify the overwintering habitat of monarchs in central Mexico. So prior to that, the overwintering sites were, it, was, it wasn't actually known where monarchs headed when they left here. Um, it was known they went somewhere, but where exactly they weren't sure, and volunteers helped to identify those locations. And so here in New Hampshire, we're not looking to start from scratch with monarch citizen science. Um, currently, there are several programs that focus on different aspects of monarch biology and ecology, where contributions from New Hampshire are going to have a really big impact at a range-wide level. So it wouldn't be meaningful for us to you know, start a monarch citizen science project that's specific to New Hampshire, because again, the conservation efforts around this species are really range wide, are really looking at the entire range of the species. And so um, if we're, we feel strongly, you know, me and my partners at New Hampshire Fish and Game, that pointing you in the direction of participating in some of these existing projects and kind of upping and bolstering the data that we have contributed from New Hampshire would be a really good thing. So I'm gonna tell you about a few of these projects. Uh, the first is Journey North, which is a relatively simple online reporting project for a variety of migratory species, but monarchs included. And volunteers are basically asked to report sightings during the spring and fall migrations through the project's website. And so in the spring, you can report things like the first monarch that you see, the first milkweed stem that you see, the first egg that you see, the first caterpillar that you see. And in the fall, you can report things like adult sightings, so sightings of adult monarchs flying about, um, roosting monarchs, so if you see any monarchs congregating in high numbers in trees, for instance, in the evening, um, and breed any sort of instance of breeding monarchs. Um, you do need to create an account, but then there's a relatively simple data submission form where, again, you're selecting the location of where you saw something and what you saw. Maybe uploading a photo and adding some comments, but not required, and then submitting that report. 
So it seems really simple and maybe like, why does that matter? But once that data is aggregated across the range of this species, so it takes a lot of people submitting uh, many instances of really simple data, these researchers are able to develop real-time maps of the spring and fall migration fronts. And so they're able to see year to year what the timing of migration looks like for all these different events and what factors potentially are having an influence on shifts in that migration. And so it becomes a really meaningful data set, even though to you it might just be uploading a few observations a year or even just one. Um, when it comes to what the research looks like in the end, um, it's really important for conservation of the species. And another cool thing about Journey North is you can sign up for emails to get um, weekly emails on updates on the migration. So like once a week in the spring, I get a photo that says, all right, monarchs are in Texas. Okay, now they're in DC. So you can kind of watch the migratory front, um, which is a, a cool outreach tool that that program has that I enjoy kind of waiting to see until they come up to New England. Another project that you can participate in is the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project out of the University of Minnesota. And that helps researchers understand factors that affect monarch reproduction and development during the breeding season. So they're specifically interested in the breeding aspect of monarch ecology. So they have volunteers across North America who are observing and reporting monarch eggs and monarch caterpillars on milkweed plants. So you do need for this project um, some sort of milkweed habitat patch to monitor. Um, many mo volunteers monitor sites on their own property. So any sort of quantity of milkweed you have on your own property. But if you don't have milkweed on your own property, you might also think about monitoring on public land or um, uh, school property or property of a nearby landowner with permission, of course. And there's a number of data collection activities that you can choose from based on your interests or how much time you're looking to commit to the project. You can do one, some, or all of the data collection activities, so it's really up to you. But at bare minimum, they ask you to um, fill out a description of your monitoring site and help to calculate milkweed density at that site. But other things you can, inc you can collect include things like recording uh, weekly monarch density, um, measuring rainfall, making comparisons between milkweed plants that have monarchs and milkweed plants that don't, um, and then even just reporting incidental observations of monarchs. Um, they sell a monitoring kit, they have data sheets available on their website, and they also have a lot of really useful videos for training. So they're not just throwing you out there with no instructions on how to do this stuff. They have actually some really, I don't love online training videos, but they, theirs are excellent. And um, they did previously do in-person trainings on occasion, though rarely here in New England, and they've just started doing some virtual training. So um, they, those might come up more in the future if this current COVID-19 situation continues. And the last citizen science project I'll tell you about is called Monarch Watch. It's out of the University of Kansas. And it's basically a volunteer tagging program that helps researchers understand the Eastern Monarch fall migration to Mexico. So this project is specifically interested in the migratory generation of the Eastern Monarch population. Um, the data that's collected while tagging monarchs and then the data that's collected from those recovered tags helps to provide information on the various dynamics of the migration. Um, volunteers, like potentially you or me, order circular tags like the one you see pictured here. It's basically a really lightweight sticker, a very tiny sticker. And you can pre-order tags on the website, but they won't ship them to you until right before migration begins in your area. So I ordered my tags in June or July, I think, but I just received them in the last couple of weeks, maybe three weeks ago, um, because they don't want you tagging the monarchs that are in that second and third generation of butterfly. They want you tagging the monarchs that are in that fourth migratory generation that are the ones that are gonna travel those 3000 miles down to central Mexico. So they have really great instructions for how to carefully capture and handle monarchs, how to place the tag appropriately in the right location on the wing, um, and then you submit the tag data via a really simple Excel spreadsheet. And so they're able to look at the data that you submit on that Excel spreadsheet on where that butterfly was tagged and some different, a, a few other different characteristics about that tagging. And then um, whatever, whoever finds that butterfly, either along the migratory route or they have volunteers who are searching the overwintering sites down in Mexico are able to use the phone number, the email address listed here and the unique code that's on that tag to report where they found it. And so that helps them understand timing of migration, um, lo potential locations of migration routes. And um, it's a really hands-on way to get involved with monarch conservation. It's very cool to handle the butterflies and especially with kids, it's a great, it's a great way to um, get them up close and personal with these, this species. 
And I'm going to move quickly through this, but just to say that it's not just about monarchs. You can also report uh, really useful data on other species. We have around 130 species of butterflies in New Hampshire. And so there's a few different places where you can report those sightings. Um, iNaturalist is one place. It's an online platform for citing observations of any plant or any animal across the world. But it also has a really great photo identification tool and um, a community of experts who are out there ready to help identify or verify identification. So if you're just learning butterflies, it's a great place to go to kind of get help with ID and kind of keep track of the species that you've been spotting. Um, eButterfly is another program specifically for folks who are interested in um, reporting observations of butterflies in general. And I don't like to give a presentation on monarch conservation without talking about monarch rearing because it's something that comes up. Um, and the reality is that often really well-meaning, well-intentioned individuals will bring monarch eggs or monarch larvae indoors to raise them to maturity. Or sometimes we'll see folks who purchase large numbers of farmed monarchs and then release them into the wild. And a few years ago, um, in 2016, a group of experts on monarchs came out and said that in reality, these activities have a negative impact on monarchs, even though, again, it's usually very well-intentioned, um, very well-meaning people who are doing this work. Um, it ultimately exposes monarchs to disease, it interferes with genetic diversity, and it hinders scientists' efforts to track migratory patterns of this, this critter. Um, and a couple years ago, data from that Monarch Watch project, the tagging project, indicated that monarchs that are raised in captivity are less likely to make it to the breeding grounds than those that are uh, allowed to reach maturity in the wild. So in individuals are really encouraged to rear monarchs on their own, only while following safe protocol practices and potentially participating in a citizen science pro project that requires captive breeding. So for instance, that MLMP project does have one protocol that has captive rearing involved. Educating others, of course, is a way that you can help contribute to conservation of the species. Share what you've learned. If you work to establish habitat, if you have milkweed and monarchs on your property, share it with others. Um, and of course, learning more. So monarchjointventure.org is kind of the clearinghouse for all data, all information on, on monarchs. Um, there's a lot of really useful handouts and uh, pieces of information, everything from management to educational activities. Um, Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, again, is doing work on invertebrates and pollinators in general, and they have a lot of really great technical resources. And the North American Butterfly Association has some great garden guides for butterflies. So with that, I'm at the end. Um, and I am close to eight o'clock, so. <laughs> So I don't know if any questions have come in, Nora, or if anyone has any questions now. Um, at this point, uh, Haley, the only questions that came in during your talk, I think you, um, you've you already responded to. There was one about timing of mowing, um, and I think that, that chart with the regional sort of uh, management windows um, helped with that. Um, so, yeah, so if folks have specific questions, I know that there are a couple of very uh, monarch-minded folks on this uh, watching. So if anyone has um, specific questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. You can also type directly into, um, into that chat feature. Hi, it's Mark and Natalia Johnson in Connecticut, and we're thank you very, very much for the presentation. Uh, we came on five or 10 minutes late. A quick question, and it's a more just sort of an observant one. To what do you attribute differences in uh, the way monarchs appear? Sometimes they seem to have white spots on the ends of their, sometimes a little more yellow, a little more orange, and I'm, and I'm interested in that. Yeah, I'm not sure there's much more to it than individual variability. Um, sometimes females can be slightly darker than males in general in their orange coloration, but um, in terms of the individual spotting, I haven't seen any research that indicates, you know, where what, what would be driving that. Um, you would, but in other species, you might imagine some of that would have some sort of, you know, regional differentiation, but this is a species that uh, is really operating as one coherent population across its range. And so I, I wouldn't imagine that's the case, but. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. We have, uh, uh, we have here where we live uh, a lot of 
milkweed and we have honeybees and we try to nurture monarchs and uh, they come and they go. We have certainly noticed in the last five or 10 years, uh, really a reduction in the number of uh, insects in general that buzz around the outside lamps on our front porch. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I think it's all uh, indicative of some of the things you've uh, mentioned this evening. Yeah, again, and that's the thing. We're talking about monarchs tonight, but a lot of what I presented, you could plug in almost any pollinator or insect species. It's just in a lot of cases, we know less about them and they're not necessarily as charismatic in some cases. Um, you know, some of our like dull white, you know, paper white butterflies, you know, people aren't as passionate about, but in reality, we're probably having similar declines in populations of those and those populations. So, um, yeah, so thanks for paying attention and for joining us from Connecticut. <laughs> Well, my, my mother lives in Tamworth, so uh, we're right. up there a lot. Nice. But uh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Does anyone else have any questions they want to ask Haley, either by unmuting themselves or um, by typing into the chat feature? I did have, Haley, I did have one question for yeah. you because um, I had been talking with one of our board members who had been involved with Monarch Watch um, in the past and then opted not to continue. One of the reasons being, um, you know, I think a fairly contagious fungi that could, um, you know, that, um, that the monarchs were vulnerable to and that potentially catching them in a, you know, catching adults in the net might, um, you know, might allow that to spread to others. Um, can you talk at all about, um, you know, any of the you know, sort of yeah. um, issues like that? So I haven't necessarily heard about that in terms of catching in a net, although, you know, now that you're mentioning it, it is, it is I would imagine, possible. Um, you know, as I mentioned, monarchs are affected by a variety of fungi, bacteria, and parasites. And so particularly there's um, some bacterial infections that people often refer to as like the black death. You'll start to see black chrysalises. Um, and that is a you know, bacteria that can spread from caterpillar to caterpillar, but we most often see it again when people are rearing in captivity. So when people are captively raising the monarchs and in that situation, usually if you remove the affected butterfly, you, know, you shouldn't see it spread. Uh, but catching, you know, incidental individual adults that appear to be healthy and flying shouldn't be, shouldn't be of concern. Um, there's also that OE parasite, but again, those butterflies that are impacted by that are visually different. You know, they are very quickly dead because they cannot fly effectively. Their wings are deformed. Um, and so you would be able to tell if you were capturing one of those. So I haven't heard that concern. I'll have to look into that and see if there's a concern with, with Monarch Watch. I hadn't heard about that um, net spreading issue. Oh, I just wasn't sure just, in, you know, in terms of some of those, un, you know, unforeseen, you know, issues that citizen science might, you know, and, and in handling, you know, the butterflies themselves. Um, a follow-up question only because you were talking about the Black Death. Does that impact um, caterpillars, the, you know, the caterpillar stage of the monarchs as well? You know, I'm honestly not certain because I've never seen it in person. I only get reports of it. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. And usually the people who, again, are asking about it are folks who are captively raising and I don't captively raise. Um, okay. So I'd have, to, I'd have to look into that more to understand exactly. I know it affects the chrysalises, but I'm not sure how exactly it affects the caterpillars. Okay, I was only, I was asking because we this summer came across a caterpillar on a on on a milkweed leaf that was completely blackened and looked like it had been cooked essentially, and we weren't we had never seen that before, and so it was a very uh, very striking image, especially for my my children. It's possible. It's possible, and it's also possible. I'm. I mean, the morbid <laughs> reality is that those tachnid flies that attack caterpillars also basically like eat those caterpillars from the inside out. Right. And so it's possible you were seeing something that was basically like a desiccated caterpillar that had been fed on by tachnid flies. Mm -hmm. Might be my guess, as gruesome as that sounds. <laughs> no, it's, um, so there are, there are a few questions that came through the chat feature, um, sort of 
some bookend ones. Um, what is the approximate date that monarchs leave our area? I know we at Tin Mountain occasionally get get calls or contact from folks that are concerned, you know, when late in the season, you know, monarchs are still spotted or are just emerging from their chrysalises. Yeah, and that's one of those um, situations where, I mean, they actually, they have right to be concerned. There's not much you can do about it in some cases, but typically we will see monarchs leaving all the way until like the end of September, even sometimes into like the first week or two of October. The reality is that those monarchs that are leaving later in the season, are maybe not following the pattern of nectar resources that they need down to the southern US, you know, as closely as they should. And so they might like run out of food resources or come into cold weather fronts throughout the migration and might not be successful. And so that's some of the participation in those citizen science projects that's helpful is like tagging those late season butterflies and, you know, while the return on some of those tags on actually capturing those tags is quite frankly very low. Um, you know, understanding if any of those butterflies potentially make it is useful information. But likely the ones that are leaving, you know, mid-August, end of August are much more successful than those that are leaving in the beginning of October. Okay, and, and a sort of the other side of that is when, you know, really is the earliest that, you know, that we should be seeing them in this area or historically? The earliest. So I wonder if anyone on the call has like an early, like when do you guys see butterflies? Um, when have you seen them? If anyone wants to chime in. Someone said this year that they were, it was like late June and it, it was just seemed way too early for monarchs. Yeah. But I, you know, out, you would see viceroys at that point, perhaps. And I, I don't know. I, I didn't see it. So, um, I would say that typically around here, late July. Nora, would you agree? Yeah, to, to when we start seeing. When you typically start seeing them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It may have been a little earlier this year. Yeah. I think in, in any given year, it can vary by like, you know, one to two weeks, but it's usually pretty consistent. Um, you know, when, do you, when do you get them down around you? Somewhere in July. Yeah. So usually sometime in July. Um, and the cool thing about those maps on the Journey North project is you can look back at previous years, oh, cool. actually see the, and you can select first sighting of monarchs and look back any year that they have data and say, and look at the first sighting of monarchs in our area. And so that's fun. Sometimes I'll like, you know, be like, shouldn't I be seeing them by now? And I'll look back the last five years or so and um, check out when the first sightings in these areas, this area was. So that's a cool tool to have at our disposal as well. Johanna, do you have... Rec, do you keep records? I feel like I'm talking there. She yeah, I, I don't keep records like that anymore. No, I mean, I used to do it when I did the um, tagging. But, uh, but I think I usually kind of looked at 4th of July almost. Oh, really? That early? Yeah, sometimes. Not a lot of them, but you'd see some by then. Yeah. And um, another thing I'll say that I, I just always thought was helpful um, is that the monarch butterflies l prefer to lay their eggs on young milkweed plants. In the wild situation, by the time they get up here, there aren't any yeah. young milkweed plants. So where I always found most of them were in mowed fields. So a hay field that had some milkweed and was mowed early and then re they re-sprout so fast. And then that's where the butterflies would um, actually lay their eggs on those smaller, mil younger milkweed plants in the cut hay fields. Yeah. So, and that's, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, just that, so that would be actually a good thing for a landowner to do was, was before they arrive to cut the hay fields and then let the milkweed re-sprout. Yeah, and that is something we've, you know, especially in the last five years or so, you know, I've been doing some trials with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, for instance, to figure out exactly what that looks like in terms of timing to mow to, um, to do just what you're saying, which is to create some mid-season mm -hmm. young, like really yummy milkweed yeah. <laughs> that are arriving here. Um, so yeah, that management piece of mowing, you can dive a lot deeper into that picture. And if you go to that Monarch Joint Venture website, there's a lot more information on mowing milkweed and uh, managing milkweed for monarchs. And that's one of the practices we would typically recommend in a more detailed uh, format is to 
it mow at least a portion. So we might not say to eliminate like the entirety of the milkweed habitat at once, but maybe mow a portion and then mow another portion. So at any given moment, you have some young, attractive milkweed on the landscape. Yeah. And what I've done for years on where I've lived is um, pulled out just so, you know, just a small area where I've got milkweed, I might take out like a quarter to a third of the plants. And people don't understand most of the time, underneath the ground, the milkweed rhizome is huge. And if you grab onto the milkweed um, stem and just pull it, it'll snap right off. And very soon after that, another sprout will come up. And so I'll just go and I'll pull a whole bunch of them up and then, uh, you know, in, in late June, early July and let them regrow that way. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, Haley, there are a couple other questions in here. One, I know you mentioned the, you know, sort of the predatory insects, but other than those, um, are there any major predators of the monarch? Um, not really. So monarchs are, again, mostly, well, the caterpillars at least are mostly eating milkweed. And so milkweed does have some toxins, although their poisonous status is a little bit over amplified in the zeitgeist. <laughs> um, but they do have some toxins that tend to bioaccumulate basically in the caterpillars. And so they're not really very attractive to birds. Hence, they're really kind of like bright coloration that says, don't eat me, I taste disgusting. Um, similar, you know, the adults have that same coloration strategy. Um, but there are some, you know, some birds, and as I understand it, at the overwintering sites have adapted to be able to eat monarchs and kind of handle those mild toxins. And so that's one predator. Um, but otherwise, it really is kind of those bacteria, fungi, parasites, and in some cases, those fly, tachyon flies and, and wasps and other tiny critters like that. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's a, a, and another related one in that. Is there any way you know, to, to actively protect the butterflies from the, the flies? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Nope. Okay. So I know, you know, some people will end up with basically what they would consider like a tachnid fly infestation in their stand of, so in any year, like they might see their stand of milkweed with their caterpillars really all being impacted by those flies. And so, you know, just now off the cuff, I'm potentially wondering, like if you did what Johanna was suggesting and did like a mid-season cut and refreshed your milkweed, if potentially you might, um, might eradicate the issue, but I haven't played around with that. So I'm not sure. Okay, and there's one more, and that is I'm reading this, and and if I get it wrong, if um, if someone wants to chime in, but they're saying their milkweed plants have milkweed caterpillars, fuzzy and striped like the monarchs, but never monarch larvae, and it says, do they coexist? So I guess thinking about other invertebrates that are utilizing um, milkweed besides the monarchs. Yes, so they are likely talking about the milkweed tussock moth caterpillar, um, which is a again a frequent user of monarch of a uh, milkweed. Um, however, I sorry, working from home. I have a I have an infant at home who's ready for bed. <laughs> Um, so I have never seen them coexist on a plant with with monarchs. Um, but likely that's because those milkweed tussock moths occur on milkweed plants in pr relatively high densities. So I imagine they make a milkweed plant unattractive to a female adult monarch to lay their eggs. Um, that would be my assumption. Okay. Uh, I have a, uh, Nora, I have a question. Sure, Judy, go ahead. Um, I have, I wanted to plant a whole bunch of milkweed in our backyard and our backyard is right next to our neighbor's hay fields. And he hays them, you know, at least two times a summer. And um, I was advised that, that it might be a problem to have them close to the hay fields, be, you know, because they are, they can be pretty invasive. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Um, I wouldn't call them invasive. I would definitely, um, they can be a, 
they can spread very vigorously. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but if an area is being frequently hayed and hayed, you know, three times a summer, which typically hay fields are, um, then it shouldn't become a heavy component of the hay field. Um, but if they're if they're hanging just like once or twice a year, which in theory they should be more, you know, like at least two or three rotations, um, then you know they can deal with it. The other option is that they would potentially have the option to spot treat or manage if it were to spread into their field. But again, with three rotations of hanging a year, it shouldn't become a heavy component of that field. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, are there any other questions for Haley? Either typing them in quickly before we uh, finish up or, you know, or as I said, you're welcome to unmute yourself. All right. Otherwise, Haley, thank you so much for, <laughs> for, uh, you know, for presenting this. It's always, you know, always helpful I think, for, for us to, to know what's happening out there and what we can do, especially you know these days when a lot of us are looking, staying much closer to home, taking um, you know, more of an interest in what's happening directly in our backyard and, and knowing the small things that we can do to help is, you know, is huge. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to see the interest and hope some of you will you know, take even the small little baby actions. It all adds up and makes a, makes a big difference. Thank you. Yes. Everyone Thank have a good you. night.